Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Jonathan Bennett joins me. We're going to be talking about Kubernetes, the way to orchestrate your containers in the cloud. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Jonathan Bennett. Episode 434, recorded May 16th, 2017. Kubernetes Update. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Bitbucket from Atlassian. Bitbucket is the Git solution for professional teams. Start your free account today at bitbucket.org slash for the code. And by GoCD, an on-premise, open-source, continuous delivery server by ThoughtWorks. GoCD gives you complete control of and visibility into your deployments across multiple teams. Since GoCD is open-source, you can download it and use it for free. To discover the power of their pipelines, visit gocd.io slash twit. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, libre, open-source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at StoneEdge.com, bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects, the little projects, projects you may be using every day and not aware of it, projects you might want to download right after this show and play with it. Uh, I've got to come up with a new opening. I'm kind of tired of that one, but that's it's so it was so innovative when I first tried it, but that doesn't matter. Anyway, joining me this week once again is Jonathan Bennett. Welcome to the, back to the show. Hey, Randall, good to be here. Cool. And uh, I presume you're still in some sort of secret underground bunker in Oklahoma somewhere? Yes, yes. The corporate headquarters home office here in Lawton, Oklahoma. All right. Do you have any windows you can look at or are you actually underground? Oh, no, no, no. There's there's a window there and there's a window over there. I, I occasionally try to open them, but there's too much street noise, so they, they pretty much stay closed. Oh. Okay, and I am back in my home in Beaverton after a very, very, very busy couple of weeks. Um, we did a couple shows during the week, so you know that I w- if you were following along on the live stream, yes, in fact, I was in uh, Boston for a week at the Red Hat Summit and Austin for a week at the uh, OSCON and had a great time, but I am exhausted. According to my Fitbit, I actually ran the New York City Marathon virtually in the one week I was in Austin, so I'm a little tired. Um, but I'm glad to be home again uh, before I take off on my next trip, which is Thursday. <laughs> it's, there's, there's no chance of it. But one of the greatest things that I saw, and it definitely relates to today's show, is containers, 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 both about uh, OpenShift's products, uh, uh, or Red Hat's products of OpenShift and the related things, and then at OSCON, all sorts of various things, um, you know, Google Cloud Computing, all sorts of people. And, and the thing about containers is, you know, it's not just you know, run something in what looks like a VM. There's much more to it than that. And one of the most important parts of that is once you get more than one container that needs to talk to another container, how do you orchestrate that? How do you monitor it? How do you do auto scaling so that if you get hit by more and more requests, how does how do you span up? And the key player that everybody sort of settled on in this arena is Kubernetes. Now, we had Kubernetes back on August of uh, 2015. Uh, That was show number 351. So if you want to pause this show and go back and watch 351, that's cool. But we'll be talking about everything that was there and more. So you don't have to worry about that. This is a standalone show. And at that point, they had just released version 1.0 of Kubernetes. We now are up to version 1.6, and there's a lot of new stuff in there. So I was asked by the guys at Google if they could come on and talk about Kubernetes. Kubernetes again to uh, to uh, kind of bring everybody up to date. Uh, one of the things I found out, by the way, a piece of trivia is that uh, it, since it was based internally on Google's Borg orchestration product that they've been using internally for like ten years or something, uh, originally when they forked it uh, or started creating the new stuff, they called it Project Seven, which of course would be the name <laughs> Seven of Nine, right? So that was kind of cute. So I guess they finally settled on Kubernetes, so it'd be a little more uh, politically correct. So uh, we have a couple people actually going to come to uh, talk to us about that and. And that'll be, uh, we'll bring them on in just a few minutes, but that'll be uh, Aparna Sinha and uh, Michael Rubin, who are going to be talking to us about Kubernetes, the past, the present, the future, what it is if you don't understand why you would need container orchestration. Uh, I'm sure they'll have plenty to say about all that. Uh, uh, Jonathan, you want to chime in here on anything about that? Sure. There's a, there's a history here that's useful to think about. So, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we were at the point to where, you know, to run a website, you had to dedicate a box to it. 
You know, you had to have a, a machine, a, a computer running the website, one computer, one website. And then Apache came along and you had the idea of virtual hosts inside of Apache. And so you could run three or four or five or 10 websites on a single machine. And then the next step of evolution with that was virtual machines so that you could have, you know, one computer or a bunch of computers and split your VMs up between them. And now we've got containers, right. which seems to be the next step of that evolution where, you know, why, why run an entire kernel and operating system for each of those VMs? Let's just cut it down to the essentials of what it needs. And so I see Kubernetes as kind of being the, uh, the cutting edge of that evolution. And so it, it's, it's definitely interesting to think about the history, how we've gotten to where we are. And then hopefully we'll be able to talk to these guys and find out some about the next steps. Where are we going well, rather than talk about talking about bringing these people on, uh, we'll bring them on in just a second, but I do have an important message before we do that, because this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Bitbucket. Let's be honest, your code is your world. You create it, tweak it, and lovingly obsess over it every day. So picking the right repository management tool is super important. Only the best for your code, right? That's why the team at Atlassian created Bitbucket. Bitbucket is the Git solution for professional teams. It helps over 5 million developers build with a purpose. Bitbucket gives teams of all sizes free private repositories with state-of-the-art features the world's best pull request algorithm pull requests facilitate code reviews you can collaborate right in the code with inline comments threaded conversations and mentions and also built-in continuous delivery branch permissions help prevent errors by controlling the actions users can perform you can get granular permissions at the project repository or even the branch level integrations with your favorite tools like docker aws and azure and because bitbucket comes from atlassian it offers the best jira integration available, giving your team everything to take your code from concept to customer. More than 900,000 teams love Bitbucket because it's used by companies like Ford, PayPal, Starbucks, and Pandora. It's the only collaborative Git solution that massively scales. Bitbucket is for the code that takes us to Mars, decodes the human genome, or drives your next car. Visit bitbucket.org slash for the code to start your free account. That's bitbucket.org slash for the code. Try Bitbucket today. What will your code do? And we thank Bitbucket for their support of Floss Weekly. And now let's go ahead and bring on our guests. Uh, Aparna Sina, welcome to the show. Thank you. Excited to be here. And where are you speaking to us from? I'm at uh, the Google office in Sunnyvale. Um, <coughs> that's where most of cool. the Kubernetes and uh, Google team is located. Cool. Great, great. I, I, I think I've driven by there, but I don't think I've actually been in that particular building. Uh, but let's also bring on Michael Rubin. Michael, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. And where are you speaking to us from? Just down the street or down the block from her or what? I'm probably like 20 feet away from Aparna in some other <laughs> small room in the, the Google office in Sunnyvale. <laughs> Awesome, awesome, cool, cool. Well, um, so give us a thirty thousand foot view. Uh, what is Kubernetes solving, and uh, and how does it do that? Uh, we'll start with the partner. Sure, I'm really excited to be here on your show to talk about Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes is, uh, you know, came come, comes from Google. Uh, internally at Google, we run all of our applications in a system called Borg, and Kubernetes uh, is inspired by Borg, but is meant for uh, all all types of applications um, on premise, in cloud, uh, locally on your laptop, anywhere you want to run them. Uh, we think that the that we found through our experience that the best, uh, most efficient way for developers to both develop as well as run applications in production is using containers. Uh, and Kubernetes automates the deployment of applications in production uh, using containers. And so there's different ways to consume it. Uh, you can consume it on-premise as part of the open source uh, offering that we have, uh, or you can consume it in Google Cloud as part of Google Container Engine, which is a fully automated uh, and Google-operated uh, current version of Kubernetes. Well, no, I'm surprised I didn't even mention this word yet, but uh, of course, I think when some people think containers, they immediately think Docker. Are we only talking about Docker when we talk about containers, or, or is there, are there other variants? Yeah, Docker is a very popular uh, runtime for the containers. Uh, there are other variants as well, Rockets, um, and th there's a host of them. The way Kubernetes deals with the runtime uh, is that we have an abstraction called the Container Runtime Interface. Uh, we interface with multiple different types of runtimes. So if a customer has a need to use something different, uh, they can. Uh, but we found that Docker is, in fact, the most popular runtime, and it's well-supported in Kubernetes. And what's your relationship to the project? 
Oh, I am the uh, lead product manager for the Kubernetes um, Google offering, as well as uh, one of the leaders of the open source special interest group uh, for product management for Kubernetes. And Michael, let's uh, let you chat for a second. What's your relationship to the project? Um, I'm a tech lead and manager of, uh, I think, the the Sunnyvale uh, infrastructure side. So that's like networking, storage, a lot of the operating system um, interactions. And uh, I've got like sort of a Linux background, so I deal with that stuff. Uh, something called the Federation, which is how we aggregate these clusters and then sharing and identity. Um, it, it's a pretty large group of people, and I sort of run around all of them. Um, we're looking at GPUs, uh, I think, this week and working with the community and all of those people to figure out how to make that work better. So I'm sort of a systems person. And um, that's basically it. I'm running around all these system problems, working with system people in and out of Google, trying to figure out what's good for Kubernetes and what's good for Container Engine. So uh, you're actually consuming. You're more like the, one of the internal users then of the Kubernetes uh, work that uh, that um, uh, that, uh, that uh, our partner is uh, working on, right? Yeah, I mean, like, so Aparna and I, I think we sit four inches away from each other. So you know, we work together pretty <laughs> tightly. Um, but you know, they're kind of our three users of Kubernetes. They're sort of the infrastructure organizations of any company or inside of Google also, where they are offering hardware resources, you know, a cluster. OpenStack is kind of a, a way to think about that and those sorts of people and those sorts of resources. Then there's cluster administrators who sort of sit in that level above it, take all of those hardware resources and then try to come up with the relationships and the, you know, the ACLs and who gets to do what. And then there's application developers and hopefully they can just run their applications and get access to those resources in a way that the cluster administrators allow them to you know provision and no one steps on each other's toes what's neat about kubernetes is that it seems to be so far a simple way for these groups to work in concert that offers you know enough flexibility that no one seems to be that upset which i think is why those simple interfaces are getting so much um, uptick but you know, it still also allows people to kind of break those barriers more often than not and do the special case things that they want. And in Google, we have some very, very large infrastructure organization that's been around for like 15 years. And, um, you know, we put Kubernetes in that environment and allow people to be their own cluster administrators and then let their application developers, you know, use that infrastructure. Um, and this is sort of what other companies do, too. Yeah. Can I add to that, Randall? Yeah. Go ahead, please, please, please. Yeah, I just want to say because I think Michael is may, is not saying everything about himself. Um, he is he is uh, one of the early engineers at Google, uh, and the folks that work on the <clears throat> Kubernetes project from Google have a history of working on platforms, like I mentioned, Borg, uh, and Michael's background <clears throat> in operating systems is extensive and very very deep. You asked about Docker and the runtimes. He's actually one of the lead people that works on that container runtime interface that is part of Kubernetes. Um, also. So Kubernetes has one of the most advanced storage uh, management capabilities, which I hope we'll get a chance to talk about today. And that's something that Michael leads um, from an engineering perspective. Uh, and then lastly, networking. I I'm, I'm hope we get a chance to talk about Google's networking capabilities, uh, although you've probably uh, talked about those before on this podcast as well. So Michael leads that area as well. So he's kind of a Uber manager for the project. Nice, nice. So I was under the impression that uh, Google internally was only still using Borg and that Kubernetes was just sort of their their uh, customer-facing project and product and uh, participating in the community now and also having this been transferred over to the, um, the uh, Cloud Foundation, which I want to talk about a little bit later. Um, so you're saying that actually there are internal consumers of Kubernetes within Google at this point? There are, yeah, can... there are. Oh, go ahead, Michael. Sure. So I, I think Google and I think anybody should be using the right tool for the right problem. And so there are some applications in Google that consume, you know, tens and tens and tens of thousands and, you know, even greater than that scale. And they are, you know, highly tuned for what we've been doing for a very, very long time. And in those sure. environments, you know, um, Kubernetes, you know, it's kind of like uh, I'm trying to give a really good example. Um you want to, you know, simplicity may not be as optimized for as the high level of utilization that Google wants at that scale. So then there are other applications in Google that, you know, simplicity and the iteration speed and um, we give them you know, a lot more flexibility to do what they need to do. And so there is a lot of uptick both in Google and out for Kubernetes. And I can tell you right now that 
uh, you know, I myself and many people on the team have been responding to internal requests for both, you know, features and things that are going on in open source from Google just as much as we are outside. It, it's interesting because um, the customers sort of range from all over the place, and we actually do end up prioritizing people sort of equally inside the team, whether they're nice, in or out. Of nice, nice. Yeah, it is kind of neat. Yeah. Cool, cool, and, and and so this is this is one of those places where you're eating your own dog food, so you get to pay attention to the things that are the most important pain points, at least for somebody at the scale of Google. Then, yes, we yes. do. Yes. Oh God, yes. Okay, um, great. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good, right? Okay. I, I I worry about companies that produce software that they don't even use themselves. You know, it's it'd be like p publishing a spreadsheet when we, we use uh, Excel internally or something, which is really bizarre. Anyway, I've seen that happen before. Um, what's the relationship of this uh, to the uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation? Sure, I can cover that. So the Cloud Native yeah. Computing Foundation owns the Kubernetes trademark and is actually, it owns the Kubernetes um, project. Uh, Google and many other companies are contributors to this open source project. And we, while we started the Kubernetes project here at Google, um, we donated it to the Cloud Native Foundation and uh, the founding Googlers were also, um, they participated in founding the Cloud Native um Compute Foundation. Uh, the reason that we donated it to the CNCF, um, and we find that to be a very effective structure, is because it needs to be a project that is not just Google uh, specific. It's something that um, we want to have available freely and openly uh, for customers and users uh, on premise in a variety of different enterprises, as well as on different clouds, including Amazon and Azure and other cloud providers. So Google is just one of the contributors. And over the course of the last two years, Google has worked very um, hard to grow the ecosystem of community uh, community members and, and companies that have contributed to to making Kubernetes what it is today. While it has the Google heritage, there's a lot of things that Google doesn't know. We don't really know that that much about the enterprise environment, certainly not when we started out. Uh, now we know a lot more. But uh, Red Hat, um, uh, CoreOS, uh, there's a Huawei, uh, Fujitsu, there's a number of different companies that have become core contributors and have added all of the, those capabilities to Kubernetes. And that's primarily uh, through this contribution to the CNCF and this ownership uh, by the CNCF of, of Kubernetes. So one, one thing Kubernetes takes really, really seriously is the diversity of um, opinion and solutions. And I think um, one of the SIGs that I think right now is doing this really well, and there are many that are doing this really well, is um, the storage SIG. Because if you take a look at how Google normally, and I know this maybe because I'm more intimately aware of it. I've been doing storage for a long time. Um, Google has a certain approach to storage and a lot of lessons learned, but you know, Red Hat has a lot of other different experiences and both groups of people have constraints, as does Diamante and a lot of the other companies and EMC that are contributing to um, storage solutions in Kubernetes. And by working with the CNCF and not just making this a Google-focused and Google-owned project, you know, things are better. Um, it really does lead to synthesis as opposed to just, you know, one group saying this is the way we're going to go. It forces everyone to listen a little bit more. Certain things in APIs take a little bit longer, but it works out. Um, I would argue that the snapshot work that we've been doing recently has been benefiting quite a bit from a literally worldwide effort from, you know, Eastern Europe to uh, the West Coast of America and from different companies pointing out uh, different perspectives and different sort of experiences and scars that we all bring together. And, I, you know, I'm involved right now about five or six SIGs and I watch this over and over again and realizing that it's, I'm a bit of a cynic, but it's been quite surprising how well people listen to each other when they have a shared goal. And the goal for everyone right now is we all believe Kubernetes is a bit like lightning in a bottle and no one wants to see it turn into maybe some, you know, some other projects in the past that haven't quite worked out. So it, it sort of keeps everybody listening to each other, which is really, really powerful. So we do have a, a, a chat room of, of people that are as smart or smarter than Randall and I are, and they come up with some really good questions. And we've got some already. Uh, Dud Trap, first off, says, in terms of scalability and the evolution mentioned earlier from VMs to containers... Is it possible to run Kubernetes and Docker within a VM so that you have one machine with multiple VMs and multiple containers running inside each VM? Can you, can you slice it up that much? 
So, Mapani, you want me to do this? Or do you want to do it? Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead, Mike. So anything's possible. Um, you can definitely, <laughs> if you want, constrain all of this inside of like one VM. And uh, if you've got enough time and that's your focus, I, uh, I think the question I've got right now is, you know, what works easily out the box and what the goal is behind this question? Would I run that in production? Probably not. Uh, if I really want to constrain everything in one VM, we do have things like Minikube that do allow you to put um, a few nodes and a, a few VMs, I believe, and, and test out these environments on like one laptop or one environment that you have in order to you know, do development and make progress and kick the tires, so to speak. Um, if you want to run something like that in production, I, I don't recommend it because so much of Kubernetes is about isolation of your workloads. And if you're isolating nodes on a VM, on a hypervisor, on a OS, on a hardware machine that maybe has one core I, I don't know how well that'll work out but it seems like it's a fun thing to try and there's a lot of neat things and experiment people have done jonathan too, was that too the many question? layers yeah i mean at question? some point uh, go ahead. yeah i know i was just wondering uh, was, was that the question <laughs> that was the question uh, whether we could run kubernetes in one vm or was the question whether kubernetes would run on vms kubernetes obviously runs on bare metal uh, runs on vms uh, on a variety of different hypervisors you can use whatever you want and w r as you mentioned earlier runs also on raspberry pis it's a cluster solution. Oh, it, so generally, it's, it is multiple machines. You could constrain all of them on one VM if you want. But I think generally, if you're trying to do that sort of development on one laptop or one device, then usually it makes sense to not constrain them on top of that on another VM. But you could. Yeah, I think the question specifically was about taking one, v, one machine and running multiple VMs and then running Kubernetes across those VMs. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, so you the, can do that. So this, this actually transitions well into a question that I had. Um, you know, we, we think about uh, virtual machines, one of the, one of the advantages <laughs> is security, because there, there's very few uh, ways, in fact, you know, they're designed that it's supposed to be impossible to pierce through from the VM back to the host OS. Uh, do, does Kubernetes, and I suppose this may be more about Docker or whatever solution is being used, does it have that same kind of robust protection such that, you know, you can't get from... Uh, the whatever application is being run, it, so if there's a vulnerability in that application, it it prevents getting back to the host OS. And then what comes to mind with this is if you're running it inside VMs, does it give you more of a protection against something like that? So I think there's a subtlety with Docker containers that not everyone seems aware of um, because they work so well. Is that they generally sh they they sh generally share the same operating system. They have different. Um, distribution file sets due to the you know overlay uh, technology, but they're all making syscalls in the same image, and so at that point you are you know undergoing the same constraints you're going to have in in the OS, uh, the Linux that you're running on for the, the level of security, um, both boundaries and guarantees that you're going to be making. Um, you know, Red Hat has a long set of experience in this area, and we talk to them a lot. Um, there are other ways around this. So if you want, there's something called a pod, which is a, a group of containers that you can run your Kubernetes workloads in. And there's one runtime that does something really neat called Fracti. And um, what they do is they run a virtual machine. Your pod runs on a virtual machine to provide that level of um, security that I think you're talking about. But if you're going to compare the you know, underlying technology of containers and their security boundaries today with what's going on with VMs, it's, it's not, I believe, the same level of fidelity. That said, there's a lot of effort, and Fracti is one of them, um, and the abstractions in Kubernetes are in place to allow providers to add other layers to, to do that. And right now, people are beginning to play with that, and there's even abstractions that people are beginning to deploy, I think, in the SIG auth work uh, group that is dealing with how do you start thinking about security um, for that level? Does that help make sense? I, I think so. I think that addresses the question, at least my question fairly well. Um, okay. uh, boy, there's a lot I want to get to, but uh, we, we have people from the chat room continuing to ask questions. So Sandman wants to know, will Kubernetes work with the Microsoft Azure container service? Yes, Microsoft's Azure uh, Container Service offers um, a, has a Kubernetes offering, and uh, that is something that is uh, available uh, and has been since uh, November of last year. Uh, they continue to add uh, capabilities to it, so it is available and it works. 
And I, I assume that it also works with uh, Amazon's cloud offering, EC2 and all of that? Yeah, so Amazon uh, Web Services, uh, there are a number of different uh, Amazon partners that uh, that are members of the uh, Kubernetes community. Uh, and, and so Kubernetes is available on AWS, uh, and there are many, many users. Uh, there's a lot of documentation as well uh, that use uh, Kubernetes on AWS. There's a toolkit um, that goes by the name of KOps. Uh, that is used for deploying uh, Kubernetes on AWS. And then in terms of the providers that support Kubernetes on AWS, there's Platform 9, which uh, which uh, provides a pure distribution uh, from the open source. There's also OpenShift uh, from Red Hat uh, and uh, Tectonic by CoreOS. These are all available on AWS, and there are there are probably many others that I'm that I'm forgetting. And I, I think so the other operative. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. <clears throat> Uh, the operative word there in the question was, what does works mean? And it's always a good idea to know exactly what the goal that you're shooting for, because I think each one of these environments have pros and cons, um, either in their network infrastructure, their storage infrastructure. Uh, we've had a lot of interesting surprises with um, you know, how AWS manages its volumes versus how like GCP manages its volumes. So knowing exactly what you want to do should be something that you think about before just jumping into any one of the providers. Sure. Uh, you, you guys mentioned something that gets all of us excited just a little bit. And uh, iPhone user 201 and I as well have the same question. Tell us more about the Raspberry Pi and running Kubernetes on a Pi. Michael, anything on that? It's fun. I mean, on one hand, it's it's just another <laughs> Linux. Um, on the other one, it's really cool because you can, uh, I, I don't know about you, but my garage is full of computers. Um, you know, large file servers and, you know, a bunch of Raspberry Pis that are good for testing things at volume. I mean, VirtualBox is fun, but it's a lot of fun to be looking at a, a host of a small rack of machines. And Raspberry Pi lets you do that. Um, you know, and, you know, you're, I, I got kids, and so it's neat to have the kids take a look at them, too. Um, so given that, it's, it's, it's a good way to understand and kick the tires of the interactions that are going on between the pods and also play games with taints and tolerances and other features. Um, Raspberry Pi is just awesome because it, it opens up um, cluster solutions and uh, orchestration opportunities and a whole world of things. And for Kubernetes, it's a really good fit. With that model that I talked about earlier, where you have infrastructure, cluster administration, and application development, um, it allows you to kind of run your own cluster very cheaply because you provide the infrastructure with Raspberry Pi. It lets you really kick the tires on a whole bunch of ideas in cluster administration and application development. Does that help? So we, yes, yes, and I, I agree. Raspberry Pis are, are just, they're neat because it's, you know, it's a full computer and it's the size of a credit card. I just, I've, I've found them very cool ever since they first yeah. came out. Um, Mick T wants to know, what does Kubernetes mean? Tell us about the origin of the name. How did we get from Borg to Seven to Kubernetes? Sure. Yeah, Kubernetes uh, originates from uh, the root word, um, I guess, for Gubert. It's from the same root as gubernatorial. Um, but uh, Kubernetes is a kind of a nautical term. Uh, it means the helm or the helmsman of the of the ship. Uh, and so that's the idea. There are many different uh, nautical terms in the infrastructure world, Docker, of course, being one of them. Uh, so when the founding team of, Kubernetes, of the Kubernetes project was uh, trying to come up with names, obviously, you know, nine of seven was one that came from the Borg heritage, a sort of an improved Borg. Um, but um, nine, you know, seven didn't seem like it was going to be easy to trademark. <laughs> so... so <laughs> So they eventually landed on Kubernetes, and it's actually served us very well. I think it's uh, it's a unique name, um, easy to do search uh, SEO, search engine optimization on, uh, and uh, it's very recognizable. Uh, well, we have a lot more questions that so we're getting from the uh, the uh, chat room, and also just I'm thinking of a bunch of stuff. You gave us a bunch of stuff to ask you, and I don't want to run out of time for any of that stuff. But before we do that, I do have an important message, because this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by GoCD. GoCD is the on-premise, open-source, continuous delivery server created by ThoughtWorks. With GoCD's comprehensive pipeline modeling, you can model complex workflows across multiple teams with ease. GoCD can easily configure dependencies for fast feedback and on-demand deployment with its parallel and sequential 
sequential execution. It offers complete customization for your software's individual needs. GoCD's real power is the visibility it provides over your end-to-end workflow, so you get complete control of and visibility into all your deployments across the organization. It supports auditable deployment and can delegate the configuration of pipelines to users without full-blown admin privileges. GoCD will perform tests written in most languages or frameworks. Their test reporting will tell you in exactly which chain set and on which platform the test started breaking. You can compare content across any two arbitrary builds, making it invaluable when troubleshooting a broken pipeline. GoCD has extension points for which plugins can be created, and numerous plugins are available or you can write your own. Say goodbye to deployment panic and hello to consistent, predictable deliveries. GoCD is open source that you can download and use for free. Discover the power of their pipelines at gocd.io slash twit. That's gocd.io slash twit. Commercial support and enterprise add-ons, including disaster recovery, are also available, and we thank GoCD for their support of Floss Weekly. So here's something that's sort of been burning for me. So, uh, you know, back in the bare metal days, you know, you'd go up, you'd spin up an operating system, you'd load all your software on it, and you'd hook up networking cables and stuff like that to get it Mm -hmm. as part of your deploy. And then uh, as we move more towards uh, VMs and then in the cloud, uh, we still sort of duplicated that in terms of just now it's a it's a partial machine, but it still basically looks like a whole machine with a full operating system running inside of it and all the tools and everything related to that. Containers pose um, uh, some unique problems, and how does what's unique about running, say, a fleet of containers that that Kubernetes has to be called upon to actually get it to work uh, in a good way? How, how is this? How is dealing with containers different from dealing with VMs for those that are not familiar with containers yet? Yeah, um, and I think maybe um, I'll start and Michael uh, can give more depth here. Uh, So, yeah, I think we went from the world of dedicated machines to having a hypervisor that abstracts away the actual machine. And that, you know, uh, provides uh, greater um, portability so you don't have to worry about uh, the underlying machine as much. Uh, But then containers raise the abstraction level even one level higher where really what you're virtualizing is the operating system. And so you're running multiple processes inside an operating system. Uh, And that uh, has two benefits. I mean, it has multiple benefits, but but the two main ones, um, it's a much uh, thinner, as you said, much lighter weight um, uh, uh, container that you're running your application in. Uh, And so it's faster to start. Uh, it's easier to scale. You can start many versions of it. Um, you can scale it down. Um, that provides the uh, agility benefits that developers have derived from containers. The fact that you can spin them up quickly uh, and 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 you know you can scale quickly. The second piece is portability because you've made the application independent of the underlying to an to a large extent independent of the underlying operating system and definitely independent of the hypervisor and the underlying hardware. Um, you can actually move your application uh, from say your local development environment on your laptop to something that's on premise to something that's in the cloud. And that's a major uh, benefit. There's a third benefit, which people are not realizing as much externally, but it has been the primary uh, benefit that Google has has um, used over the years, you know, for search and Gmail, which is that of resource efficiency. So now that you have your application containerized in a way that it can be moved and it can be scaled, you can actually pack <laughs> multiple applications onto the same um uh, same uh, uh, set of machines and same set of uh, you know same operating system layer. You can pack them much more efficiently. Uh, you know something we call bin packing. And what you need though in order to do all of this is an orchestration solution, a management solution, and that's what Kubernetes provides. And it takes that heritage from Borg, which uh, you know which which has really been optimized for container scheduling, for uh, making sure that uh, you know even though a server may go down or there may be an issue, your application always continues to run. So it's been uh, optimized for availability um, and and is, um, uh, you know, optimized for, for, for portability and efficiency. So those are the things that you need uh, an orchestration system for. Uh, there are many other things. Obviously, you need to be able to store data. So you need to be able to connect to storage. As these containers are moving around, you need to be able to connect to storage on different hosts uh, seamlessly without the application having to know or without anybody actually having to know. This is all done automatically. And similarly, the uh, management of the of the network with regard to the application. So all of this is what Kubernetes does in a very application-centric way, abstracting away all of the underlying infrastructure. Michael, uh, and feel one, free to one add question to that. that I hit. Okay. 
Yeah, let me first follow up with what you're saying first, though, which is that, so one thing that people might not realize is that, like, when I when I build uh, fixed VMs uh, on my machine, I, w- I would sort of manually assign IP addresses to it, and then if I had, like, front-end web servers and back-end databases, I would tell each other what those addresses are. And and one of the new problems then with containers, is, especially if it's auto-scaling, is how do they find each other? And is, is this something that Kubernetes is, is particularly good so- at? Yeah, can I can I jump in? So I think a lot of yeah, it depends please. on where you want to put your cleverness beans. And so what's nice about Kubernetes, and I think again the reason why it's it's done well, is it allows the application developers to put their cleverness beans just in their app. So if they're building applications that are going to interact with each other exactly as you just said, Randall, they don't have to start wondering about provisioning nearly as much. They can throw things in a pod. They can then set up some very basic networking constructs, and then suddenly um, all of the the provisioning and the coordination of the infrastructure below them just sort of takes care of itself. Um, you know, I don't want to call it magic because as soon as you call it magic, someone gets disappointed and that's never good. <laughs> but it it does help out quite a bit in exactly the sort of things you said. You know, you can actually not care about your storage now with 1.6 and say, I just want some some disk space. You know, and anyone in a large company I know always has to, not anyone, but often you have to argue really hard with two or three organizations to get like 10 gigabytes of disk. Um, with Kubernetes, you can let the system set itself up to just grant these things without having to talk or go through permissions. It's just programmable. Same thing with networking. Same thing with um, the sort of machines that you are allowed to run on and the sort of machines that you're not. The application developers don't have to think about it. They put their cleverness beans exactly where they should be, which is writing good software and iterating on that software. They don't even have to wonder so much about the dependencies on, um, I'm going to be really careful with these words too, and if there's sort of anything I want out in the world. um, In my view of terminology, an operating system is made up of a kernel and a distribution, where the distribution are those files that sit on the kernel. Um, Mm -hmm. Containers, again, share that, that Linux kernel, but distribution dependencies, it's a huge headache. And, you know, um, often you have to tell application developers you're using CentOS only or ArchOS only or, you know, Ubuntu only. Well, you allow them with Kubernetes to pick anything they want. So they can completely work in their own environment with their own selection, with their own freedom, and do this in a way that doesn't adversely impact the overall system. Um, or the cluster administrator, and give them headaches of what they need to track. And then suddenly, let's say there's a new CVE or SSL issue, then the cluster administrator can update everything in the registry, whack a button, hit upgrade, do auto-scaling, all of those um, administration activities that generally require coordination. The Kubernetes does that for you. And so the cleverness beans and all of that thinking you had to do before just kind of handled um, the, the one last caveat, though, is remember that the kernel version still matters, and it is something to think about. I think we're kind of in a honeymoon phase now because the technology is so new, but you leave a cluster running for a long time. If you're not keeping track of that kernel version, you may find out you get a surprise sometime in the future. And this is why managed solutions and um, companies that host Kubernetes for you, they then take even more of that off your hands so you can devote your cleverness beans once again to writing the good software and this is really where i think kubernetes helps you know companies and people with solutions you know software is about imagining things those who imagine faster and can improve their solutions they are able to do really really neat things and um kubernetes helps people focus on that facet of the solution and not worry so much about the detrius and all of the plumbing that keeps people like me excited, but, you know, may not be uh, the area that you want to get involved in. Does that make sense? I uh, re- Yes, please. It's perfect. Thank you. Uh, one of the things I just want to also make clear to the audience, um, uh, and, and you can fill in and tell, correct me if I'm wrong, I recently uh, was commissioned to generate a talk about the 12-factor app. And one of the things that was most remarkable to me, and I hadn't thought about it that way before, is that a container really is a single app. It's typically one PID, you know, running and maybe some auxiliary things take care of that. But you wouldn't have both an app and a database running in a single container. And you need things like Kubernetes to coordinate how they find each other. Yeah, and like this is the cool part. Instead of thinking like with just a container of your app, with Kubernetes, you can start thinking of a service. And a service is a living, breathing system. It's a system that can grow, shrink, 
get upgraded, you know, um, involve all of these housekeeping activities. And with Kubernetes, it's not something you have to concern yourself. Again, um, you, you know, you only have so many cleverness beans, only so many places that you really want to think hard about. Kubernetes allows you to focus on the pieces that only, you know, you as a software developer can deal with, that want to deal with. And it lets your your uh, application become a, a full fledged cloud service. Yeah, and I think awesome. I want to add to I want to add to that that you know the the hosted offering that we have on Google takes that a notch higher where we provide deep integrations with uh, the the uh, first class network that Google Cloud has uh, and provide a lot of. Um, deep integrations with our storage uh, capabilities uh, and our managed uh, storage capabilities, managed database capabilities as well. So those are available as services to use in conjunction with the services that you may build um, on the container engine offering. And as Michael said, um, you know, by... Uh, by having Google Google SREs, uh, Google Site Reliability Engineers, uh, run and manage the Kubernetes offering here um, on Google, uh, it really completely frees up application developers uh, to to focus on building the best applications, uh, and we take care of everything else. Yeah, I mean, just, so what's just, actually? Just, go ahead, sorry. So I, I've been in the, the bowels of Google's deep infrastructure for a long time because I like working at scale. And one of the things that really pulled me to this team is um, being able to help people, you know, and helping customers that come to, to Google and being able to harness all of the experience Google's had with the infrastructure layer I described before with SREs and even managing Kubernetes and staying on top of all of the versions that are coming out and being able to manage the master and the node interactions. It It is still... It's always going to be something else, a layer on top of even Kubernetes infrastructure that needs to be paid attention to. Um, G Google Container Engine is a really good place for this. And once again, to have even less cleverness beans invested by the customer and let you focus on doing what you do best. It sounds okay, like so an no, ad, yeah, we're, it's cool. No, no, it's fine. I like it. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. So, uh, you know, it's funny. The, the time is flying by here, so I want to make sure. The, the first question I had when I booked this show is, okay, we did have Kubernetes on, you know, two years ago, at, just after the 1.0 release. You're now at 1.6. Can you kind of summarize what's happened in two years in the Kubernetes community? Wow, yeah. I think there's been uh, enormous, I would say, <laughs> exponential hockey stick growth, um, you know, in the product, in the community, in the user base. Um, let me start with the user base. Uh, I think sure. anywhere you go um, today, you can barely... There's, you can barely escape being a Kubernetes user, you know, and you might not know it. Most, most often people do not know it. But, like, if you are reading the New York Times or if you are submitting your expenses using Concur, or if you were watching uh, U.S. Daily, um, uh, I think U.S. Daily News, the, the one that is uh, calculating the statistics for the U.S. elections on November 8th, um, those applications are running on Kubernetes. Uh, again, because it is open source and it runs in so many different environments, people are using it in, in all kinds of different environments. And because it has that benefit of being able to scale uh, to the demand that the application has, so many different applications are using it. So that's one, is that the user uh, user base for Kubernetes has just exploded. And uh, you can find m many more examples of that on our website. Um, you know, people are using Kubernetes in China. Baidu is using it for machine learning. People are using it, you know, Yahoo is using it in Japan, uh, and so on and so forth. There's so many different users. Um, secondly, on the ecosystem, like you said, yes, the ecosystem has been growing very rapidly. And again, it's kind of a virtuous cycle when you have more users that are interested in using the product. You have many more companies and, in fact, individual contributors that uh, want to build more. And also... A lot of um, uh, a, a lot of I think some of the growth uh, certainly for for the ecosystem has been seeded by um, the uh, Google and other companies that are that have uh, cultivated this ecosystem. So there's a uh, there's a growth path and a way for 
uh, contributors, we've created a very inviting and inclusive community uh, where uh, developers can come in, they can choose the projects that they want to work on, work on and they can pair up with advanced uh, engineers uh, and start to contribute and learn the ropes that way. And so, um, you know, there, I think there's uh, some of the statistics. We have more than 1,100 contributors uh, to the project, uh, and that continues to grow. Every time I quote that statistic, it's higher than it was the last time. <laughs> Uh, and so, uh, from from the open source perspective, uh, you know, I don't I don't even necessarily have a good count of the number of companies, but I think, as I mentioned, the largest um, uh, single set of contributors after Google uh, is actually individual contributors or independents. So it's not uh, wow. a project that's yeah, it's yeah. not a project that's uh, created by any one company. So that's on the um, on the ecosystem, and then on the technology, I think that uh, is it is just. From the 1.0, I think in 1.0, Kubernetes maybe supported 100 nodes per cluster. Now mm. we are at 5,000 nodes per cluster. So that is a massive um, you know, uh, trajectory in terms of scale. Um, we've added a lot of capabilities. I mean, certainly the extensibility of Kubernetes, as I mentioned, we have many different runtimes that we uh, that we support. Um but extensibility on at all levels, um, you know, on on networking, there are many different networking solutions. There's a standard that's evolved, which is called Container uh, Networking Initiative (CNI). There's a new emerging standard around storage um, that that's in discussion. Uh, so, uh, and and many storage vendors that um, that have plugins, um, you know, to the uh, to the Kubernetes. Uh, 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 storage uh, interface, uh, and so on. So in terms of technology, I think the, the two other sort of major pieces that I would call out um, is um, stateful support. Uh, so where we started with, I think containers were very popular two years ago for stateless applications. But over time, we have really invested in supporting batch and stateful applications so that you can run scale-out databases inside your Kubernetes cluster. And there are a number of Helm charts um, that are available for stateless app for stateful applications. You know, CockroachDB, um, MongoDB. Uh, there's a variety of, of these. Elasticsearch is one of the more, more common ones. Postgres SQL. These are ones that... Um, Kubernetes users are running in Kubernetes clusters today, and there's there's more and more sort of uh, growing um, knowledge uh, of how to do this. Uh, so that's that's one major area since uh, the 1.0. The other major area is uh, is on cluster federation or hybrid cloud, and I think that um, there's a lot of development there. Certainly throughout 2016, we added yeah. uh, you know multi cluster, how to manage multiple clusters uh, from a single API mm. endpoint, and we continue to develop that. Wow. And uh, I understand that one of the success stories was, in fact, uh, Pokemon Go. Do you want to talk about the results for oh, that? Oh, man. So there, there's a there's a bar in uh, Saratoga where I did a lot of debugging for that, um, you know, in coordination for many of the teams because, you know, we'd, we'd be working on that. Pro it, it, it took everyone by surprise, uh, the, the success of that application. And um, I would argue that it was a, the first sort of test of Kubernetes scalability. And um, we we learned a lot. Uh, because the project was not quite as uh, long in the tooth as it is today. And what was neat was that both every pe people at Google and people outside of Google, because it was hosted at Google, so we kind of took point a little bit, but the community also, everyone got involved because everyone wanted that to be successful. And I remember just working and finding the strangest issues which you find with scalability and then running home, you know, eating dinner and then just, you know, running to this place where I could just, you know, get my head into things and, and you know, work and talk to people. And because there was a lot of open source issues, it was it was A-OK. -okay. Um, and then just going through and, and then solving problems. Um, it was it was interesting. It had a lot of networking issues, a lot of DNS scalability. DNS is like oxygen to Kubernetes and like many network services. Um, you know, it's funny what happens a lot with Kubernetes. And I think when you asked earlier what's different with 1.0, um, when you do cluster management, being able to decide who's which pods and workloads are, are special and what to do with the fact when you over-provision um, or when you have, you know, resource surprises, you know, you'll, you'll put a workload or a set of containers in a resource envelope. And what happens when that envelope isn't sized correctly? Sizing your application is really hard. And I think that the, uh, the Pokemon Go effort was learning as they went because, you know, as much as they were providing, people wanted more. It was just so popular. So learning how to take things at the limits and how Kubernetes could deal when it was being pushed that hard was a lot of fun. I can give you actually more technical 
details if you want um, and talk about, you know, funny things like log collection became a really big deal um, with, you know, Umin a lot more than we expected, orders of magnitude more than we expected. Uh, but I, I don't really know what you want to talk about. It's, it was it was not forgettable. It was very cool. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> well, if we had a second hour, I'd love to talk about a lot of more, more detailed things. I'm just trying to mostly give the overview. Of, um, you know, when would I reach for Kubernetes? And I think we've had a pretty good uh, summary of that so far. I also then wanted to ask from that perspective, what is is is, is this going to require me to invest, you know, two months of training for myself before I could even start playing with it out of the box? Is, is there a simple case with all the everything's all defaults that I can sort of experiment with? And and uh, and how far do you have to go from there to actually have something like you know what I used to think the equivalent of like ten web servers talking to a database in the cloud? Um, it, it, what's where what, what what's my learning path for that? And how long does it take? Yeah, let me start with that. So. Um you know, it's often said that uh, Google Container Engine, which is our hosted offering, is the easiest uh, way to start with uh, Kubernetes. It's a great environment for um, anyone that, that wants to learn the system. It does not take uh, much time. I, I mean, to create a cluster, you just simply uh, you go to the UI and there's a button. Um, and... <laughs> You know, you have a I can cluster. do that. <laughs> Anybody can do that, yes. Yeah. Um, and there's a set of uh, simple tutorials, I think probably 10 minutes, um, you know, to do a tutorial and get your first application running on Google Container Engine. And from there, um, it's fairly straightforward to, to learn how to use the system. Really, most of your time uh, is devoted to building your application and how do you want to architect your application? Um, you know, what should it look like? Which services do you want to have and how do you want to connect them together? Um, that's in a nutshell, kind of how to get started with Kubernetes. That was, that was one of the mini, most yeah. amazing things I... Uh, go ahead, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I think Minikube is something else to Google for. So if you want to start, like mm -hmm. Maparna said, Google Container Engine is like falling off a log. Uh, but if um, you want to do things local, uh, I think Minikube is something to start Googling that. Uh, I think Kubernetes got a bad rap, I think, initially because we focused very much on the second day experience and less on the first day experience. And I think that has to do with mm -hmm. a lot of Google engineers, you know, had SREs around to help them with that. But there's been a lot of progress since then in making that first day experience better. So Minikube is a, is a good thing to look at. And um, there's, you know, go to Kubernetes dev and ask questions there too, and you'll find people who will be willing to help you. Yeah, one of the yeah. things I was noticing, uh, because uh, uh, we are actually planning on deploying uh, containers and probably using Kubernetes as a framework uh, at my primary client, ZipRecruiter, uh, and I'm actually developing courseware right now to actually talk about that and a follow-up to the 12-factor app uh, courseware that I did for them earlier this year. Uh, one of the things I found is that there's because Kubernetes is being used by so many people, there are hundreds of blog entries, uh, unfortunately, various ages, so that it might be super easy to do something now instead of the way it was before. But, you know, if yeah. you want to get started, there's, there's definitely enough community support out there that you'll find something. There is. There definitely is. And there's a lot of YouTube videos and a lot of, um, you know, uh, information available, um, you know, through tutorials and so forth. So it's quite easy to learn about the technology. Um, but again, there are different audiences. There's the developer audience, and then there's the cluster operator audience. And I think that uh, certainly the cluster operator audience, the infrastructure people um, will find that uh, this is very exciting technology and you can get into the guts of it and you can learn about it through YouTube videos or you can read the documentation or do the tutorials and so forth. But for uh, developers who don't want to have to learn all of that, uh, there's no need and it's much easier to get started with a hosted offering um, or just to use one of the tutorials and like Michael said, uh, you know, use Minikube. So there's different layers. You can learn at, you can learn about Kubernetes at whichever layer is, is most interesting to you. Yeah. Awesome. And we're almost out of time. So let me, uh, let me ask about the roadmap. Well, actually, Sandman in the, in the uh, chat room reminded me to ask about that. What's, what's in the future for Kubernetes? Where, where are we taking this? Sure. Um, so, you know, when we announced 1.6, we talked about uh, the direction, which is, uh, you know, um, uh, larger clusters with uh, multiple workloads and multiple users. And so we've invested heavily in RBAC, in advanced scheduling techniques, uh, and uh, we are continuing to uh, enable different types of workloads. So as I mentioned, Stateful and Batch, there's a lot of interest in machine learning. There's many users, uh, you know, using uh, a Google Container Engine for machine learning, all the way from 
ads to, you know, kind of uh, personal assistants or chatbots and so forth. So there's lots of that kind of uh, workload, certainly on Google Cloud, um, that that happens. And we want to make sure in our roadmap to continue to support stateful applications and multiple different types of workloads, uh, multiple different teams. Um, certainly, uh, RBAC is a start towards that, but um, we're also working on uh, additional multi-tenancy capabilities. We will be um, there, there's a capability called uh, network policy, uh, which uh, mm-hmm. is about to move to GA in the one, in the next release, uh, and so that's something that's that's coming as well. Those are some of the main areas of focus for the roadmap. Well, as I said earlier, it's um, you know we could keep going on this for another hour. But unfortunately, we only have so much time from the Twit Network, so uh, I need to start wrapping up. But one of the things I want to ask, uh, this is for both of you, um, is there anything we didn't cover yet? that you wanted to make sure our audience is aware of? You know, I think I think the one thing that uh, I would say that, um, you know, we, we, we didn't touch on as much is, um, is kind of, you know, the enterprise adoption. Uh, we are seeing a lot of enterprise adoption in uh, Google's cloud environment uh, on GKE. And I think that that's something that, again, because we are usually the first ones to introduce the latest uh, uh, Kubernetes release, this is where it gets the maximum sort of uh, uh, production testing and production readiness. And, and we are finding like the way that uh, Pokemon Go, you know, really stretched um, uh, where Kubernetes was going and sort of uh, took us uh, Took us into 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 a bigger territory. We're also finding this mm-hmm. finding the same case with enterprise users. And Michael's been involved in a lot of that. He's very customer focused, uh, and so uh, you know we're very excited about uh, both uh, enterprises coming to Google Cloud as well as enabling the hybrid uh, cloud capabilities where they have mixed workloads, some on premise and some in cloud. So I, I got three quick things, and one of them builds off what Aparna said, which is. It's, it's surprising to me now as we get more and more um, high-end and demanding customers that the first one is, is a scramble um, to make sure that they have everything that they need from both Google Container Engine and open source. But like the third and fourth now, I mean, we generally have things lined up. Um, it's very surprising to me to see how quickly we're able to meet most of the customers' needs and how eager these high-end customers are in putting things in production. You know, I think there's a belief that, you know, is Kubernetes really good enough to, you know, put real workloads and, you know, have lots of money riding on it? Um, evidently, people are doing it. And I, I was quite surprised by how fast it happened. The other one is that if you're a developer and it does look intimidating, please go to the SIGs. There's a list of special interest groups. If there's an area that you're interested in, um, a bunch of the, the ones that are more mature have onboarding um, and, you know, if you go to an email list and say, how do I get involved, pick up a bug, um, start writing a test. Those are the best ways to sort of get your hands dirty and learn about the development. A lot of very good solutions have come out of just engineers coming out of nowhere and getting excited about it. Um, that's what really makes it better. And it's a lot of fun. It's very approachable. You know, the, the, it's go. So the environment is not the most intimidating programming environment that uh, you can see in open source. Cool, cool. Well, it sounds like uh, when Skynet gets deployed, it's going to be running Kubernetes. So (laughs) it's probably a good thing to learn about anyway, to see if we can get it back from the robots when they finally come out. Yes. So uh, uh, I have two final questions. I have to ask everybody or they, my audience actually yells at me. They send me emails. You forgot to ask those two questions. So um, uh, for both of you, one at a time, uh, Aparna, um, what's your favorite scripting language and what text editor do you spend all day in? Oh my gosh, favorite scripting language. Um, you know, I I don't code that much anymore. It used to be that I really liked Perl. I was a big fan. Yay! Um, yay! Oh. Yay! Oh. Finally. Oh. I'm an, <laughs> you made I'm, day. An, I'm an electrical engineering by training. I did my PhD and I use Perl all day long. So, um, your other text editor, um, yeah, I'm I'm backwards there. I mean, I guess I use Emacs. So, what? No, no, that's perfect win. Perfect win. We've got no, two out of two. No, 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 no. this is awesome. No. Okay, Michael, um, same questions. You can offset her if you I, want. <laughs> I, so I used to write firmware. So um, I view Go still as an interpreted language, though I know that's debatable. Yep. Um, I've been burnt sure. by Python way too many times, and let's. I I don't want to bring up Perl stories. Um, okay. I, I like C. I like C a lot. I tend to think in C, yeah. and it seems clear and, and um, a very nice way to think about things and arrange what you want to do and express. Um, as mm-hmm. to editors, 
I, I still use VI. Um, I used Emacs till my hand started hurting because I, I came into computers very late. <laughs> and so uh, I don't touch type. It, it's really bad. And then I, I went to Vim and it works well with screen and my, my life just got a yeah. lot better. And, uh, and Vile okay. is just, Vile is bad. Okay. Okay. Well, that's pretty good. We got to wrap up quickly here. So, uh, hey, the, thanks both of you for bringing us up to date on Kubernetes and really explaining that you know if you're going to roll out some machines in the cloud or actually not machines but containers in the cloud, this really is some place you want to be focusing on. And it seems like it's the uh, center of the container universe for at least to the next couple of years until somebody else comes along with something even better. So, thank you, Aparnasina and Michael Rubin, for joining us today. Cool. Thank you thank very you. much. Thanks very much. Very good. Boy, that was a fascinating show. That was great. And again, we could have gone on another hour, but, uh, you know, the Twit Network says, this is all the time you get, this amount of time. Uh, so what do you think there, Jonathan? Oh, that was, that was fascinating. I learned a lot. A um, couple of things stood out to me. One is Michael's uh, comment about cleverness beans and uh, letting the application developers put the cleverness beans in the right place. I, I thought that was an apt illustration, but really what he's talking about is abstraction. And it's it's kind of hmm. what uh, it's what Linux and Unix, I suppose, originally did, so that people didn't have to write in assembly all the time. It it allowed people to abstract away the hardware and gives them an OS. And you know, we we talked at the beginning of the show about uh, virtualization and how we're virtualizing more and more. Another way to look at that is we're abstracting more and more of the details away, so that we let the people doing the work plant their cleverness beans in a, a a further forward location, abstract away the rest of it so that they don't have to worry about it. And I think that's really interesting to, to think about how that uh, computing and our industry is moving uh, moving that layer of abstraction slowly forward and forward. Um, and that seems to be the trend. It's really interesting. And then there, there are two great signs about Kubernetes and, and Google working on it. The first is that they are using it themselves, where it makes sense they're using it. And, you know, that's a really good sign for the health of a uh, open source solution. Um, and then it works on their competitors' platforms. You know, they've they've made everything open enough, and they are they've given it to the community enough that you can use Kubernetes on Amazon, you can use Kubernetes on Azure. And I think those are both really really good signs about the health of Kubernetes. So I, I two thumbs up. <laughs> Yeah, definitely, definitely. And uh, like I said, we're almost out of time. I really want to get to the end of my... Th Thanks for that summary. I, don't, I won't even bother summarizing the summary because that would be no good. Let me move right ahead into the uh, who's coming up next because we have a really long list now. Uh, I've been filling the slots and it's been paying off. So next week we have the Node.js Package Manager, otherwise known as NPM. Familiar to many of you who are doing especially front-end work, but now people are doing uh, back-end work writing uh, the equivalent of make files using Node and things like that. Following that, Faraday RF, which is a digital radio networking using the 33 centimeter uh, um, amateur band. We just added to the schedule Pelosa. Actually, I saw them at, uh, um, is it Oscon, I think it was? Maybe it was uh, I forget. It all blurs together now. I don't know whether I saw them at Red Hat or Oscon, but uh, it's a distributed bitmap index for massive data sets. So you have a bunch of properties, about a bunch of rows, maybe millions of rows, and you want to have like all the people who are over 35 that uh, drive Toyotas. And those are like little bits, and you want to be able to index massive data to be able to pull out these booleans on all those things. This is going to be really cool. We're talking about them, about large, large, huge data. Magento, which is a commerce platform. It's uh, shopping carts on steroids, as I said before. Just added to the schedule. I'm really excited about this. Just added to the schedule. We're going to have some people from Google talking about Flutter, which is the Dart-based uh, platform that compiles for both iOS and Android, native high-speed applications, 120 frames per second, uh, and makes really Really, really nice stuff. This is just coming out of the Dart community. We've got people talking about that. Uh, so that's uh, cross-platform mobile apps and Dart. Really excited by that. Uh, Cockpit, administer your Linux system via the web. Uh, we have also uh, Brian Bellendorf, uh, who is going to be talking to us about Hyperledger. And I saw a couple talks on Hyperledger this week. Uh, it's about uh, blockchain technology, being able to uh, have reliable, um, authenticated information in the cloud, uh, owned by nobody, but verifiable by everybody, similar to the way Bitcoin 
Pennsylvania is today, and actually is based on some of that technology. Also just added to the schedule as of like yesterday, Jenkins, the big uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment server that's probably the number one server that's in this area, originally forked from Hudson, uh, but when uh, uh, Oracle bought Sun, it's one of the projects that uh, decided, oh, we don't like Oracle, poof, we're starting our own thing. So we've actually got the uh, the head guy from that project as well. Um, you can find out about all these and more. Go to the Sprig spreadsheet at twit.tv slash floss. Uh, if you have any other suggestions, please tell the project leader or uh, uh, community coordinator to email me, Merlin at StoneEdge.com. My address is right there on that homepage. Uh, we still have, uh, f- uh, f- I just opened up like five or six more slots because we're filling up everything all the way through, but we can always take more. We can always make more. I just need to add another line to the big spreadsheet with a question mark at the beginning, and we can put in somebody else. We take a live stream on this show, 9.30 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, it's been Tuesdays for a decade or so. Not a decade, maybe about five years. Uh, but we're moving to Wednesdays. We're moving to Wednesdays on June 28th. So we'll be live Wednesdays from there on out. We um, They needed the slot for Tuesday, so they wanted to move me around. You can follow us at Floss Weekly on Google+, uh, and at Floss Weekly on Twitter. Unfortunately, I forgot to post anything there for the last couple of weeks for these two shows. Uh, I will get back into that. Don't worry. I do know how to run this show. I just occasionally forget. You can follow me at Randall L. Schwartz on Google+, and at Merlin on Twitter. And uh, I... Uh, and actually, if you've did that in the last few days, you you would have come across a remarkable story of some story that was 20 years in the making that is a, 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 a very bizarre relationship I have with Brad Fitzpatrick, the guy who created LiveJournal, MemcacheD, um, a bunch of file systems, things like that, and is now working on the Golang. Uh, you, you, it, this is uh, something that happened at OSCON, and I'm just really, really uh, happy to have still grinning from the story, so go check that out. I'll be up at the uh, Pearl Conference in D.C. in about six weeks. I'll be at Dragon Dragon Con in Atlanta in September, talking about Dart, actually. I'll be at allthingsopen.org in the Research Triangle, which I've never been to before, which is nice. So adding a new spot on my big map, of pin map of every place I've been. Uh, again, it's an open source conference. Going to be able to uh, pull up some new guests for this show. Um, anything you want to plug uh, before we get out of here, Jonathan? Nothing really to plug. I will say that it sounds like we have some really super interesting shows coming up. And uh, looking forward to uh, looking forward to hearing some of those. Looking forward to the shows in the future. Yes, and there's even more on the stack. Uh, we got about six or seven people looking for uh, new shows. And I'm holding up, uh, if you're not watching the video, I'm holding up about 20 business cards from people that I bumped into at these these last two weeks that want me to put them on Floss Weekly somewhere. So I am sure we're going to be busy all the way through the end of the year with the a bit of research I did over the last couple of weeks, which is good that I don't have to do that anymore because, man, I'm so exhausted from the last two weeks. But I'm just wasting time. Jonathan, thank you for jumping in and being the co-host again today. Yes. Good to be here. Awesome, awesome. And we'll see you all again next week on Floss Weekly.